Good morning. As we prepare our hearts to worship, as people are still finding their seats, I invite you to remain seated during this song of a preparation. Nothing but the blood. says, but, but as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 
For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Let's pray together. Father, we gather here today to praise you as the one who has power over death. You sent your son, Father, to die in our place so that we might have hope, that we might have life even in death. God, you are praiseworthy. Your great power and your might that overcomes sin and death in this world and in our lives. That you came into this world to undo all that Adam brought to us. All his sin, all his guilt, all his condemnation that we have inherited as sons and daughters of Adam. And through Christ, Father, you demonstrate your victory over all sin and all death. And we praise you. Father, who are we that you would look on us, would come to us, the perfect and holy God, would look to us and intervene on our behalf, that you would consider us, and yet you have done just that. Father, we are humbled, we praise you, that you help us, that you give us eyes to see and faith to behold the glory of Christ. You give us hearts that desire you when we were far from you. And Father, you give us victory over sin in our lives, over death. Through Christ, as Paul says here, you make us alive. And we praise you for making us alive in Jesus. Father, we give you thanks today. We praise your great name because of our great Savior. In whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you're willing and able, won't you stand with us as we worship. Oh, okay. Sorry, God. We just... And this is giving Andy permission to go over today. So sorry if you're here longer than originally anticipated. <laughs> But uh, October is uh, Pastor Appreciation Month. Thanks again, Tanya, for uh, reminding me of that. Uh, I'm very good at almost forgetting. Well, I'm, I'm very good at forgetting every year. <laughs> so uh, uh, we have a, uh, a very fortunate staff of pastors, I do believe, here at Safe Harbor. You know, they're not perfect because none of us are. So we have to remember that. You know, <laughs> we, we can't hold them to being perfect because we're not perfect either. So. But just, uh, we want to take a minute to thank them for all that they do for us uh, each and every day. I know the kids put some uh, packages together for them, and the church is very gracious, and uh, hopefully they feel the love and care each and every day. Can I just take a second to feel proud of All right. Well, praise God. Thank you all. Hey, Chris, uh, also, for scripture reading, I'm going to be on red. Thank you all. We're, we are humbled uh, to, uh, to serve you all as pastors. Thank you for the privilege of, of being able to do that. I forgot to mention, uh, just want to welcome everybody. Uh, if you're visiting with us, there should be a connect card. If you have a prayer request, you can fill out that connect card and drop it in the offering plate as you leave. Um, also, a couple quick announcements. There, the youth group is not meeting tonight because fall break is finishing up. Uh, we are starting back up on Wednesday nights at 6.30, so I hope you're able to make it this Wednesday at 6.30 for preaching and prayer time. We also have our family faith night uh, from 6.30 to 7.30. And uh, if you're not connected, we would love to see you get connected, get to know others in the church through a D group, through our, our Sunday morning Bible studies, or just uh, spending time together. Uh, and so let me know, let any of us know how we can help you uh, get connected to others in the church. And let's continue uh, worshiping together. All right. Well, yeah, if you're able, let's stand and let's let's worship the King and uh, 
all glorious above. And let's gratefully sing together his wonderful love.
as we look to God's word once again. Of course, all that we're doing is looking to God's word, isn't it? Everything we sing, everything we pray, everything we preach and read is God's word. I'm thankful for that. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, and then we'll follow that by a prayer of confession. So I'm reading from the CSB this morning, verse 17. And he said to the man, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust. Bow with me, church. Our Heavenly Father, we we confess our sin of being rebellious. And the times on a weekly and daily basis even, where we choose other things over you, where we have that same rebellious spirit and heart that, that Adam had at the very beginning. And we ask your forgiveness of that, Lord. We pray that you cleanse us, that you cleanse us from all unrighteousness, as your word says you will. When we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord. Thank you for that. We don't take that lightly, Lord. Create in us clean hearts and renew right and steadfast spirits within us, Lord. With each of us here. Thank you for making a way, Lord, for us. The only way, through Jesus, that we can be forgiven and made right before you. Forgive us, Lord. Cleanse us. You are worthy of our praise, our glory. And we continue to worship you, Lord, through song. It's in Jesus' name.
to have you all this morning and and we're going to be continuing on in our Romans series and uh, we started chapter 5 last week we're going to be finishing out chapter 5 uh, today starting with verse 12 so open your copy of God's perfect word this morning or you can follow along on the screen Romans chapter 5 starting in verse 12 hear God speak this morning through his perfect and holy word therefore Just as sin entered the world through one man, 
and death through sin. In this way, death, death spread to all people because all sinned. In fact, sin was in the world before the law. Charge person's account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression. He is a type of the coming one, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if by the one man's trespass many died, how much more have the grace of God and the gift which comes through the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflowed to the many. And the gift is not like the one man's sin, because from one sin came the judgment, resulting in condemnation. But from many trespasses came the gift, resulting in justification. Since by one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. How much more will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Christ? So then, as through one trespass, there is condemnation for everyone. So also, through one righteous act, there is justification leading to life for everyone. For just as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so also through the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. The law came along to multiply the trespass, but where sin multiplied, grace multiplied even more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace will reign through righteousness resulting in eternal life. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we, have, all father, we have all followed our father, Adam, at some point in our life. Maybe some of us out there are still following our first father, Adam, living in sin, living for the world, living for our own pleasure, doing what pleases us and what we think is right for our lives. Thinking that we're doing the right thing because we're following our heart. But the Bible says that our hearts are wicked. And therefore, if we follow our hearts and follow our father Adam, this leads to death and condemnation. Eternal. Forever. Living away from you. None of us wants that. We have been deceived into thinking that we're okay when we're not. But you did not leave us there, Lord. You loved us too much. To leave us in our sin and in condemnation that we earned and deserve. In fact, you loved us so much that you sent another man. The God man, fully God and fully man, Jesus Christ. To live the perfect life that we know we never will. To fulfill the law for us. To be persecuted and sent to a death on a bloody cross. Not for anything he did wrong, for he never sinned. But for the sins of the world. And if we're trusting in him. If we rejected our sinful life and we decided we're not going to walk with our father Adam. We receive Christ and his righteousness through repentance and faith our sins past present and future are nailed to that cross and are dealt with forever this is good news 
This is the best news. And Lord, help us to live there. Not in our past flesh. Jesus is our Lord. And he is our only hope. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This time, uh, the kids, elementary age kids, can make your way down to your classes if you would like, or you can stay here with us as well. And if you have your Bibles, leave them open to Romans uh, chapter 5, as we just read together. It's good to be back with you all uh, this morning after being gone last week. Always love being with my church family. One thing uh, you might not know about me is that I uh, really enjoy working outside. Uh, I like to work on landscaping uh, and getting my yard, uh, working on my yard and my shrubs and that kind of stuff. Some of you are like, you're crazy. All right, that's work. Who, who wants to do that? But some of you all may enjoy that. But if you've ever done that before, if you work outside, work in your yard, work on shrubs and landscaping, that kind of thing, uh, it can be enjoyable, but it, it can also be really frustrating at times. Just when you think you get things right, uh, a weed pops up or uh, something grows the wrong way uh, or it doesn't grow at all like it should. Uh, I remember one time when, when we lived in Nicholasville, uh, my wife and I, when we were first married, and the house we had had a bunch of uh, kind of a hedgerow behind it, and uh, including some large honeysuckle bushes. And uh, I, I remember those bushes just got out of control. I mean, they would just grow huge. If you've, if you've seen those things before, they just keep growing. And they just invade and take over, pretty much was taking over like half my backyard. And so I was like, well, I'm going to cut these things back so I can enjoy the yard and get out and actually do something in the grass. And so I cut them way back, and it seemed like just a few months later, they had grown back and were even bigger than before. Um, and so I, I was Ah, these things, they're, they're my nemesis, right? Uh, and so finally I realized, after trying several times to cut them back, that I wasn't going to be able to keep those things under control unless I cut them all the way to the ground and then just killed them at their root. Uh, that's really what I was going to have to do. Well, uh, sin is a lot like those honeysuckle bushes, right? Sin, just kind of, you, you can kind of chop at it, and cut it back and think you're doing pretty well, but it will just grow back and it will keep growing and growing and it won't go away until we address the root of our sin. But to understand how we're going to address a killed sin at its root, we need to understand where the root is, where it comes from. We need to understand why sin is the way it is in our life if we're going to attack it and kill it and defeat it. And we need to know, well, what is God's solution for killing that root? It's not a bottle of Roundup. It's something else. And that's what we see here really in Romans 5. Paul giving us insight into the root of our own sin, where it starts, and God's solution to overcome it. His bottle of Roundup for sin. And what we see here in this passage, the main idea of what we see is... That Jesus is the only one sufficient to uh, overcome the sin and condemnation that all have inherited in Adam. Jesus is the only one who is sufficient to overcome the sin and the condemnation that all have inherited from Adam. Now all people, so and another way to say this is this. All people are in one of two spots, right? All people are either in Adam they are classified as being in Adam, identifying themselves with who Adam is and what Adam has done, or all people are in Christ. There's only two choices. Today, you and I, every single one of us, uh, the Bible tells us, it makes clear here in this passage, we are either in Adam and like Adam with his sin and all, or we are in Christ, identifying ourselves primarily with him. We are either under the, the condemnation of sin and death, or we are under grace, which has freed us from condemnation and death and given us life. So which one are you? 
Think about your life today. Would you say that you are primarily in Adam, under condemnation, feeling the weight of your sin, knowing you deserve death because of your sin? Or are you in Christ knowing that he has set you free from the penalty of your sin and the guilt of your sin, and you are living life with him in his grace? Well, what we see here in chapter 5 really helps us process that and, and think through, well, what, what does that mean? How do I go from being in Adam to in Christ? You know, earlier in chapter 4 of Romans, Paul uh, goes back all the way to Abraham and David to explain how God justifies sinful people. Well, today, he goes back even further, all the way back to Adam, the first human being, to help us see how Jesus changes everything that has been in the world from the beginning. How Jesus undoes all the wrong that came into this world through Adam because he wants us to see how great Jesus is and how much we need him. In verse uh, 11, last week, Pastor Chad talked about how we can rejoice in God through Jesus. We should have joy even in our sufferings, even in the hard things, but in, in the good things, right? We can have joy in Jesus. Today, Paul tells us why this is possible, why joy is possible for your life, and why joy is possible for my life in spite of who we are as descendants of Adam. So let's see. Let's see how we need to understand what Adam has done, how that affects us, and how Jesus is the solution, the one who kills the sin that we've inherited from Adam at its root and gives us power to have joy, to rejoice in God. All right, the first thing we need to see in this passage is that we need to recognize that Adam's sin is not just his sin. Adam's sin is the source of your guilt, your sin, your shame. All right, what do I mean by that? Well, Paul explains it. So, so just like with that honeysuckle bush in my backyard, we need to understand the root of sin if we're going to overcome it. And Paul tells us here in Romans 5 that the root starts with Adam, what Adam has done. You need to know that the problem of your sin goes all the way back to him if you're really going to address it. Know what God's answer is for it. Verse 12, let's read that together. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, in this way, death spread to all people because all sinned. Now, uh, in our kids' classes, even this morning, Safe Harbor Kids, they've been learning on Sunday mornings about the book of Genesis, about creation, about Adam. And uh, it's, it's important that we teach our kids about the beginning of the world, about Genesis in the book of Adam, because understanding what happened at the beginning and what happened with Adam is foundational for us understanding our lives. And that's what Paul is getting at here. Adam is not just somebody who lived thousands of years ago and what he did was, yeah, it was bad. Adam is someone who, what he did affects you today and it affects me. Now, Paul knew right here in Romans 5, it makes clear Paul did not believe that, that Adam was a mythical, metaphorical figure in the world, right? He believed that Genesis literally happened, that Adam was a literal man, the first man of all creation. And the Bible tells us that God created Adam and Eve. He created Adam from his own hands because of his care for him, his concern for him, his design for him. And he created Eve from Adam's rib, the first humans. God placed them in the Garden of Eden to walk and live with him, to enjoy God's presence, and to glorify him. And Adam and Eve in that garden were instructed to do one thing that they couldn't do, and that was to eat from one tree, the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that actually happened. And those actual first people actually disobeyed God. And what God did, we saw, we see in Genesis, God banished them from his presence. They could no longer live in his holy presence because of their sin. They had to leave the garden, and a curse was then brought onto the human race and to all creation. 
as a result of their sin. And that's really what we see here in verse 12. Just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, then death spread to all people. And that's the curse that you and I bear. It goes all the way back to that. Paul believed all this was true, really happened, literal. Paul was a man who knew God, who walked with God, who saw the risen Christ, and he believed the Bible. He believed the Old Testament was true and real and from God. And he walked with him, trusting in what God said, knowing that what God said meant something for him. And you can trust the Bible too. A little side note. The Bible is true. It reveals God and his life, the way to life. But Paul doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say, well, Adam, Adam is just history. He, he makes us see how Adam's sin affects us. The first way Adam's sin affects us is the obvious, obvious thing here is death is now a reality. We experience this in our lives all the time. We see the heartache, the, the struggle, the tragedy of death. He says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. Why does death exist? Because sin exists. And it all started with Adam. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And that's for Adam, but that's for you and I. Death exists because of our sin. Adam's sin also affects us because in him, we have sinned. In Adam, we have sinned. Verse 12, death spread to all people because all sinned. Now, the, the theological idea that Paul is getting at here is, is what is called federal headship or representation, or you might call it original sin. And some of you are gonna, don't get bogged down in those big words, right? These are theological words. But what it's saying here is God regards Adam, his choice, and his sin to be ours. When Adam sinned and was declared guilty, God declared all other people who would follow in Adam's footsteps to be guilty because Adam was our representative. If we had to pick one person to represent us before God and with our best option, God, this is going to represent us and whatever he does represents us. It's like an election in our country, right? We choose a representative to represent our interest, interest at Congress and whatever they decide we have to live with. Well, that's kind of what the way that God set it up to begin the world. Adam represented all people who would follow him. And whatever he did, we have to live with. And what we see here is that as our representative, God is saying, God chose him because God, the one who knows all, knew that what Adam chose is what each one of us would have chosen. It's like a representative who perfectly knows everything we want from our congressman. And he puts, we put him in place because we know he's going to choose exactly what we would choose. Well, that's what God did when he put Adam in the garden. He put Adam there because he, know that, he knew that Adam would choose to interact with God the way that we would. And as that result, Adam represents us. So God made Adam without sin. He was the best hope for mankind to live a sinless life perfectly with God. He was the best that humanity had to offer. And yet he still sinned. He still walked away from God. None of us could have done any better than Adam. And as a result, because he was our representative, we are now guilty too. That's what Paul is saying here in verse 12. Now you might wonder, how is that fair? Like, how can God hold me guilty for what somebody else did? That's a good question, right? Well, first we should acknowledge that not only are we guilty because of what Adam did, we're guilty because of our own sin too. Both are true. There's original sin and actual sin that we commit. And you know this is true. You know the reality of your own sin in your life, your selfishness, your pride, your desires. But also realize that God has set up this world with the idea of a representative because just as one man can represent us for God and brings judgment... God also set up that one man could represent us and bring forgiveness on our behalf when we couldn't do it. So if one person can bring guilt 
onto all people, then God could also choose one person to bring forgiveness and life to all people. Both are true. And that's the good news we're going to see in a minute. But for now, Paul makes clear that Adam's sin means that you and I are guilty because he represents us before God. Verse 13, in fact, sin was in the world before the law, but sin is not charged to a person's account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression. He is a type of the coming one. So we see in these verses, sin was in the world from the beginning and the evidence that it was in the world, even though God didn't give the law until later on, you know, he didn't give the 10 commandments until the book of Exodus, right? So that's a whole book and a half after Genesis and the fall of Adam, even though he didn't give the law, sin was already there. And the evidence of it was that there was death in the world and death is always the consequence of sin. And so the proof was that people died. Now, in Adam's family, sin and death reign over all people. All people are born in Adam. You and I are born in Adam. And that is the root of your sin, of your guilt before God. And you can't fix it. You can't fix what somebody else has done to represent you, can you? You can't go to Congress and say, well, I'm the representative now. Uh, that representative was wrong. He didn't represent me rightly, so I'm going to do it the right way. You can't do that, and you can't do that with God. It has been inherited. It is yours, your guilt, your sin. And so what do we have to do? We have to look to someone else. We have to look to someone else who will represent us with perfection before God. And you may say, I don't want that. I don't want somebody else to represent me, someone who's guilty. Well, if you represent yourself before God, what's the difference? We're still guilty. But there's a third option. So how does that happen? Well, we see that in the rest of this passage. We see that Jesus is sufficient to overcome Adam's sin in you. So in the first few verses, we have seen how Adam's sin has ruined everything and everyone. We stand here today as people ruined by sin. But that doesn't have to be the final word. The root of our sin is in Adam. We can't fi fix it. We can't get to it. Just like that honeysuckle bush. You can't kill that plant unless you can get to the root and understand it and attack it where it needs to be attacked. Well, we can't get to the root of our sin by ourselves. But someone else can. Paul wants us to see how Jesus gets to the root of it. And he addresses all the shoots coming out of it and brings something new and better from it. So Paul contrasts Adam and Christ to really show how Jesus is greater than all these effects that Adam has brought to us. How Jesus brings us the hope we need. He gives us the solution that we need that we can't do ourselves. And so what Christ has done for all who are in him is greater than what Adam has done for all who are in him. And we see that in verse 14, we read that Adam is a type of the coming one. And then Paul really unpacks what this means, right? Adam and Jesus are alike in some ways, right? First of all, they, came, they both came into this world sinless, right? And secondly, they represent us. We have a choice of being represented before God by Adam or by Jesus. And, but they're also very different, right? They're, they're very different in that Adam did not leave this world sinless, he walked away from God in sin, and the results are very different. Jesus was perfect. And so verse 15, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if by one man's trespass or sin, the many died, how much more have, has the grace of God and the gift which comes through the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflowed to the many? All right? Adam brought a debt to all people. Because we are born in Adam, we have a debt to God that we can't repay. You have a debt. Your sin means that you have a debt to God you can't repay. You can't make up for it. And we owe God. The only thing we can do is to live with that debt by ourselves. That's all we can do. 
But Jesus brings a gift that repays that debt and more. Our debt was judgment. It was eternal death in hell. Jesus saves us from that debt, that, that penalty, and gives us grace. Verse 16 through 21, Paul shows us four ways that Jesus overcomes this debt, this weed that's growing like crazy in our lives, and kills it and gives life. That's what Jesus does for you when you repent of your sin, when you trust in him and put your faith in him alone and give your life to him. First of all, we see that Jesus overcomes the power of sin in our lives. It kills it at its root. Jesus justifies those who were condemned. Verse 16, the gift is not like the one man's sin because from one sin came the judgment resulting in condemnation. But from many trespasses came the gift resulting in justification. So we see the, the difference, right? In Adam, condemnation. In Jesus, justification. And justification we've already seen is that, that God declares us right. He, he declares us to be debt-free. We are justified. We are declared innocent. And so we see that Adam's sin makes all people guilty and condemned. Jesus, his perfect life, his death on a cross as an innocent, perfect man means that he pays that debt so that we are declared justified and right with God. No matter what we've done, no matter what, and this is how Jesus kills the sin in us. When we know that Jesus is willing to declare us innocent and right in spite of what we've done, we've done we don't want that sin anymore. We want Jesus. And so now God can declare people who identify themselves with him as debt free. And we are condemned by a representative. We are set free by a representative who we identify ourselves with. And, and we say, he's my representative. I'm holding to him before God. How are you holding to your representative Christ before God? Are you holding to him? And he declares us innocent. Through a representative, he did what none of us could have done. Lived perfectly before God and died for others. Second way, Jesus demonstrates the power that he has to, to kill the root of the sin in our life is Jesus gives life when death reigned. Verse 17, if by the one man's trespass or the one man's sin, death reigned through that one man. So, right, so we see Sin brings this death reigning in the world to us all. It includes physical death. Yes, but it also includes a spiritual death. That we are cut off from God, separated from him, hurting, desperate, don't know what to do in life. And it hurts us and it hurts others. In verse 17, and when it says that death reigns, we think of a broken, anti-God world. And just think about that. We see that, don't we? How sin and death reign in this world. The lies all around us, crimes people commit, broken relationships, abuse, cruelty, sickness, tragedies, greed, self-centeredness, pride, unrepentance, bitterness and unforgiveness, all these things reigning all around us. Some of us wrestling with those right now. As Romans 8.22 says, creation groans under the weight of sin. Creation groans. We feel that. We groan under the weight of our sin. And it doesn't feel good. And we struggle to do the right thing. We struggle with others. And what Jesus does, we see has power over death and sin reigning. We struggle with, because we inherited it from Adam, but we can also inherit something that has power over those things. At verse 17, how much more? So if death is reigning, how much more will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life? 
through the one man, Jesus Christ. If you feel like death and sin are reigning in your life, this is good news. How much more will grace reign in life through Jesus than that feeling you have? We're promised eternity where grace will reign forever. No more sickness, no more hurt, no more pain, no more heartache. But this is not only a statement about the future life to come. The idea here that Paul is getting at is that Christ inaugurates, he begins a new restoration in life now. It's both future and now. Romans 6, 4, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Walk walk now in newness of life. This is hopeful. This is good news. Being in Christ brings new life to your life now. If you are not in Christ, or you're not living in the light of Christ, think about what this passage says about how Jesus can bring his life to you right now. I don't know what your struggle is. We all have struggles. Jesus can bring life to it. If you have marriage troubles, imagine that Jesus has the power to redeem those because he does. To bring joy and satisfaction in your love for one another because Jesus and his life are there. If you're struggling with addiction, Imagine not only just not falling off the wagon, just making it, but being freed to where you can help others find true freedom. Because the power of Jesus can do that. If you're stuck in guilt and depression because of the power sin has had on you, imagine the freedom and the peace that Christ can bring. That's the power that Jesus has to to help us to reign in life and overcome the reign of death and sin. Jesus has power in all these things and more. Jesus is the only one who gets to the root of these things and brings life. And he restores life to what it was meant to be and offers life instead of death. And when you know him, when you know his sacrifice for you, his love for you, and you love him, those things that had power, that reigned over your life before, They become less, and your love for Jesus becomes more. If you have repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus, this is available. If you have not repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus, you don't know this power. You've got to be willing to lay down your own life first, to turn from a life apart from God, live your own way, and trust in Christ and his way. That means repenting of your sins and trusting in Jesus and professing faith in him right now. That's the only way that Christ and his life will reign in you. So what are you holding on to that's keeping that from happening? Lay it down and turn to Jesus. And I would love to talk with you about that if you don't know what that means. Well, we resonate with verse 18. So as through one trespass, there's condemnation for everyone, and we, we see it, don't we? There's death all around us, sin, So also through one righteous act, just one, there is justification leading to life for everyone. Jesus and what he did was enough to bring life to everyone if they will trust in him. That means he did enough for you. So we see that Jesus demonstrates his power in that way. Third way, Jesus demonstrates his power to kill kill the root of sin is that Jesus is able to make you righteous in spite of your sin. We've seen that all throughout Romans. We see that again in verse 19. For just as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so also through the one man's obedience, perfect obedience to God, the many will be made righteous. Through What Paul is saying here is through Jesus' obedience to God, perfect, Jesus always obeyed the Father. Through his obedience, you are now made obedient to God. That means in spite of You going home and getting angry this afternoon, God sees you as obedient to him. In in spite of you struggling with a lustful thought, God sees you as obedient to him because Jesus represents you 
and you're walking with him. Doesn't mean those things are okay, right? We don't want those things if we're walking with Jesus. We want Christ to overcome the sin in our life. But Jesus declares you obedient, righteous, perfect. This is a gift. And this is how Jesus conquers sin in our life. When we know he does this for me, in spite of what I've done. Fourth way Jesus demonstrates the power to kill the sin at its root is Jesus enables us to live by grace and not by law. The Christian, the one who knows Christ, knows life is not about how well you keep God's rules. That's not where true life comes from. Your life instead is about faith in Christ, the one who kept God's rules perfectly when we failed. That's called grace, not law. Verse 20, the law came along to multiply the trespasses. In other words, when God sent the law, he sent the commandments, all it did was show us how big sin really was in our life already, already there. It just showed us. It didn't mean that when God showed the law, people would just stop sinning because they saw it. No, it just made it even bigger. And it just meant they needed some other solution because they couldn't do it. Verse 20, but where sin multiplied, where we saw how big sin was in our life, grace multiplied even more. In other words, grace is able to cover all those sins. As big as sin gets in our life, God's grace is able to overcome it all. Our sin was great. His grace is greater and unlike the law, grace is the solution for sin. Grace is what allows it to be forgiven and helps us overcome it. And we know that Jesus is better than sin. When we know his grace, we will overcome it. When we know it and we live for him. Sinful people are changed because Jesus has conquered their hearts. His grace has wrecked them. That's how God changes people. If you are struggling in sin and you want God to change you, let his grace wreck you. Let his grace grab a hold of you. And you realize what he's done for you, and you can't keep sinning. When you know Jesus like that, you can't do it. If you are in Christ, Jesus does that for you. His grace has more power than all your sin. He's overcome the penalty of it, the guilt of it. He's overtaken the righteous anger of God on himself. And he's overcoming the power of it in your life now. That's what he does for those who are in Christ. You've got to walk with him. We come to the end of the passage and listen to the good news of verse 21. So that just as sin reigned in death so also grace will reign through righteousness, resulting in eternal life through Christ our Lord. Doesn't that sound good? Grace will reign in your life. This is a beautiful conclusion to this chapter because it just really shows how Christ reverses everything wrong in our lives that we have gotten from Adam. This is the solution to the world. This is the solution to our struggles, your struggles, my struggles. Christ reverses all those. He has power. His grace has power over all those. For those who are in Christ, grace now reigns. That's a current reality. Grace rules your life. This is the great hope for all who know Jesus. Because even though we still live in a world that's filled with sin and death. We see that. We live in a world that is filled with sin and death. Those things don't control our lives anymore because of Christ. They don't control our life now, and they don't control our eternal destiny when we know Jesus. To be in Christ means that we are in the world, but not of the world, right? We grieve because sin is still there, but we don't grieve as those without hope. As Paul tells us, that our sufferings now are not worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed. That we are sorrowful, but we're always rejoicing. Do you see 
how when grace reigns, it changes our perspective on everything, on grief, on sorrow, on suffering. Grace reigns, it changes life, everything about it. Why? Because Jesus is that powerful. His grace is that great. And understanding this grace in your soul is how Christ becomes your life. Understanding Christ's triumph as my triumph changes how I see my past failures, my present struggle, struggles, and it gives a hope for the future. Right? It changes everything about our lives. What we see in this passage is that when Jesus exposes the sin, he exposes the root that we have inherited, the guilt we've inherited from Adam, Jesus has the power to kill it and bring something beautiful from it. Not an old scraggly honeysuckle bush, something beautiful. That life that God gives comes with Jesus working in us and through us. Is that you? Is Jesus and his grace, the reality, the grace he's given to you, is that reigning over your life? Or are you still stuck in Adam, sin and death reigning? Christ invites you. Let his grace reign. Give your life to him. Walk with him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are a God who reigns in grace. In spite of our sin, in spite of the death we feel, the spiritual death we experience because of sin, the physical death we see around us, Lord, your grace is greater than all those sin. We praise you for that, and we pray that we would experience that, every single one of us. Lord, do that in us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing and respond to this good news of grace reigning. If you don't know the grace of Jesus, come see me or one of the other pastors. We'd love to talk with you. If you want to pray, I'll, I'll kind of stand down here at the front. We'd love to pray with you. But uh, let's sing and just respond out of hearts of thankfulness for the new grace that God has given.
Let's join our hearts in a silent reflection of God's word that we've heard today in, in every way. Lord, we offer you our praise, and you are worthy of all glory and all praise. Be glorified in our lives as we go through this week, Lord. And we ask and pray that in Jesus' name. Church, live victorious this, uh, this week, victoriously, in the redeemed life that God has given us. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, uh, please reach out to him today. Come talk to us, and uh, don't walk away from God today. Uh, he loves you. We love you, too. Have a great week. We'll see you, Lord willing, next uh, Lord's Day.